Welcome back to the second panel. Um, there's a slight change to the running order. We're starting this panel with a presentation from Angela Gendron from Carleton University. And then that will be followed by Dr. Anne Alley from Curtin University. And then thirdly, Dr. Maura Conway from Dublin City University. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Angela. Uh, good morning, everyone. Nice to be here. Um, my uh, PowerPoint here is very basic, but I thought it might just give a little bit of structure as I go on. Uh, I think it's, we all agree that since 9-11, um, but more particularly since the July 2005 attacks, that the threat, the terrorist threat in the West has been perceived as coming from within, from young people living in Europe and North America who are inspired, uh, radicalised and drawn into terrorism uh, by ideologues radical preachers, jihadist clerics, etc. Uh, and they're espousing Al-Qaeda's revolutionary and violent interpretation of Islam, either in person or in their online presence and the materials they provide. So we've got a homegrown threat, which is a particular concern because it is analogous to a sort of fifth column of long-term residents uh, who repudiate the values of the society in which they are embedded. So this is the problem in terms of radicalisation. Uh, I, I was interested in that quote, the ideological pipeline, which is what we're really talking about. This was said in terms of counter-terrorism and uh, dealing with um, homegrown terrorism in Britain, but Pantucci, whom I'm sure you've heard of, um, uh, he uh, said, well, it's far more important to break that pipeline than it is or uh, is it as important as it is to stop terrorists coming into the UK, but a far more difficult thing to do. So the need to understand the radicalisation phenomenon, when, why and how people living in a democracy become radicalised and susceptible to militant Islamism, has been at the centre of academic and public debate for some years. And it has generated a number of primary data research studies but we're still not yet in a position to determine why structural or individual level drivers lead to the radicalisation of some individuals, but not to others. So I want to start briefly with uh, what we know about the radicalisation process in terms of the various research approaches that have been used. So these are the three. I'm particularly indebted to uh, a paper by... Dalgard, Anja Dalgard, a Danish researcher, who did a summary of this back in 2010. Um, the sociologists contend that overall structural factors such as globalisation and the weakening of traditional communities are developments that have led to questions about identity in young Muslims. For example, Keppel, Roy and Khosrow Kava suggest that the search for identity can explain why even Muslims who are well-educated, from affluent backgrounds, seemingly well-integrated in our society, nevertheless may resort to violence. Why is that so? Um, they don't explore in any depth why it is that only a minority of Muslims, um, exposed to the same structural influences, uh, don't become radicalised. But Roy talks about factors such as travel and lifestyle, which may differ, and Keppel, um, he actually refers to the influence of radical preachers. Moving on to social movement theory and network theory, uh, we're talking about scholars such as Viktorovitz uh, in the first and Mark Sageman in the second. Uh, they've contributed empirically based research which is theoretically informed. Um, and they've looked at the specifics of recruitment and radicalisation processes in Europe. And their findings influence, as you probably know, bonds of friendship or kinship as broader social networks and transmitters of radical ideas. Um, and Sageman, of course, it's his bunch of boys. It's who you know as much as anything else that leads to uh, radicalisation. And then we move on to the last one, the empiricist case study driven approach focuses on individual motivations and despite a deficiency of solid empirical data, research of this type has highlighted a diversity of drivers and triggers. A Dutch study that I refer to by Poot and Sonnenschein, 
I think I've said that right. Uh, it, while it admits to methodological constraints and a, a lot of overlap, nevertheless identifies four categories of activists within radical groups. Um, and they're differentiated in that study according to particular circumstances and motivations, but essentially it's um, illegal foreigners, I think I've got them next, illegal foreigners, uh, active and or reformed criminals and addicts, seekers, and idealists and political activists. There was a, a mention earlier on about foreign fighters. I would think foreign fighters really come into those two middle categories. Um, and, and so in that sense, when we're talking about their qualifications, their level of education, their motivations, they're very particular. Foreign fighters often are not those who want to commit jihad at home, wherever their home is. Um, so these different research approaches being used to explain the process of radicalization should be seen as complementary rather than competing. Um, they focus on different levels of analysis and different aspects of the phenomena. Many identify factors which reinforce rather than contradict each other. But in some, and unsurprisingly, uh, the social environmental factors render some individuals a range of social psychological and environmental factors render some individuals more susceptible to militants than others, which doesn't really take us very far. We're still out there on the search. So for my purposes, um, it's that last category, the idealists and political activists, which is particularly relevant to radical preachers, jihadist clerics and so on. Whether you talk about that in person, a direct influence, or whether it's an online presence. Um, why? Because the Dutch study identified that it is these people who are overwhelmingly motivated by social and external factors, not the internal to the individual, their vulnerabilities, their psychological hang-ups, their insecurity needs, etc. It's the economic, political, cultural, etc. that motivates them, and they get very angry about it. They look around the world, they see Muslims whom, in their perception, are oppressed, and they're asking why and what, what needs to be done. But even more interesting, uh, well, let me just first say, um, in the post 9-11 environment, as we know, because counter-terrorism measures have been effective, we're now into bottom-up recruitment rather than top-down recruitment. And so the leaders of these cells, of uh, cells of uh, terrorists who are usually led by that last category, the idealist and political activists, um, they have a lot of influence, certainly in terms of recruitment, but in terms of radicalization as well. It's they who are the driving force in the cells. And so we have to say what's motivating them. I've said it's social and external factors. But the study goes on to say that the idealists did not become radicalized because of personal experiences, as Sageman suggested, um, but because they were responding to perceptions, the perceptions derived from television images, videos, audio tapes, websites, online sermons, and the stories of others, the, sort of the narrative is coming here. Um, and so based on, if you like, second-hand information, they are angry and they are justifying a violent response to what they perceive to be the problem. Um, so moving on to the charismatic leader then, my shorthand for the jihadist clerics and all the rest of them, the self-styled imams and so on. Um, Thomas Precht in 2007 uh, very clearly identified as a trigger factor the presence of a charismatic leader or spiritual advisor. Certainly the Quilliam Foundation too in a study in 2010 also identified a charismatic leader as very important the Quilliam Foundation focused on the importance to the cell leader of a charismatic cleric, imam, or whatever. So the two are saying the same things, but what we need to do is look at this a little bit further. Um, uh, I guess all three studies allow space for the role of the charismatic leader. And it can be uh, an international jihadist, um, like Anwar al that Martin mentioned, um, who operates at the international level, 
both personally and online. It could be a local self-styled imam who leads discussions in fringe group meetings locally and only the select few Muslims are invited to those meetings, i.e. the ones that look as if they're committed and can go on to become more radicalised, uh, or radicalised at all, I mean, you know. Um, or uh, it could be, um, which one didn't I mention? The, the, um, uh, the cell group leader, of course. So all three studies allow that a charismatic leader is important. It could be at the international level, a local preacher, or the cell group leader, him or herself, but it's been himself so far. So my interest in the role of jihadist clerics uh, derived, well, started with a research study I did back in 2007 for the Canadian uh, Integrated Threat Assessment Centre, uh, and I looked at al-Qaeda propaganda and the role of preachers. And more recently with Martin, we were asked to do a study of um, a group of three Canadians who um, had been radicalised and went abroad to fight. Concern, of course, then was they might come back and do something at home. Um, and it seemed that, that th those three had very largely been radicalised by online materials, particularly the materials provided at y Anwar Orlaki. I'll say a bit more about him later on. But as Martin's already said, he produced a lecture series, Constance on the Path of Jihad, and he has an internet guide, 44 Ways to Support Jihad. And together, these two are among the most frequently downloaded materials on jihadist websites and so on. And we actually spent five hours listening to Orlaki's 44 Ways, and we almost became convers converted ourselves, didn't we? <laughs> oh, oh, the Constance. OK, it was the Constance we listened to. But, I mean, it was very, very powerful indeed. Um, so, like the majority of uh, those radicalised and drawn into Islamist terrorism, um, these three young men were part of a leaderless jihad, as it's come to be known. Um, largely self-radicalised, self-activated before, if ever, contacting operatives of Al-Qaeda or other affiliated groups. They eventually left North America and they haven't returned since. We don't know what's happened to them. Uh, in the West, potential activists and peer group leaders are identified and targeted by radical preachers or jihadist clerics in order to awaken them to Al-Qaeda's worldview and convince them of the necessity and justification for militant jihadism. Viktoritz, Vic Viktorovitz and other social movement scholars call this process of achieving congruence between um, the individual interests and the organisation interests uh, as frame alignment. I think somebody's mentioned that framing term earlier today. Now, individuals, individuals come under that uh, Salafist, jihadist umbrella for a number of different reasons. And it uh, is possible for those preachers to tap into existing um, sentiments and take advantage of them. Uh, by that I mean they're angry perhaps at uh, having not been promoted at work or having been discriminated against, etc. But the preachers are quite prepared, if necessary, to take advantage of religious ignorance on the part of young Muslims um, and other grievances as well. And what they do is manipulate individual values and beliefs for radicalisation purposes. Um, within, uh, none of this is to undermine the importance of the role of the leader within the cell and the importance of trusted peer relationships and kinship to that radicalisation process. But what the evidence does suggest strongly is that the internet and the online materials posted by extremist preachers is now the primary medium by which potential recruits are exposed to the influence of radical events, radical revisionist ideas. The internet is a propaganda, uh, a conduit for propaganda designed to radicalise young Muslims around the world and inspire them to fight uh, jihad at home or abroad. And it was certainly central to the North American case study I've mentioned. But of course it's also, and as has been mentioned this morning, it's been influential in luring young Britons to Syria to fight against the Assad regime. Um, keeps getting a lot of this. That was the uh, general factors, yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 
So I just sum up there, idealists are driven by social external factors. They um, get their view of the world through perceptions provided by the media, by the media etc. And uh, bottom-up recruitment is key and that gives the cell leader a lot of influence now. Call us to Islam. So, um, call us to Islam, the role of clerics, preachers, to call Muslims to active practice or the faith or return them to a vow. Most Muslims would uh, agree that this is a commendable factor. The problem lies, or the difficulty lies, is that the extremist preachers I'm talking about are peddling a, an extreme form of Salafist jihadism. Um, and who are these preachers? Uh, they may be erudite and trained scholars and clerics, local imams, imams who are not religiously qualified, international preachers who also may not be religiously qualified, um, and they particularly have shifted their focus onto online activities. So uh, the focus of what I'm saying now. <laughs> Primary medium, I've made that point, a conduit for propaganda to urge Muslims to fight jihad at home or abroad. Some of the extremist uh, preachers I've been talking about, you'll recognize these, Abu Musa al Suri, a sort of pen jihadist, an ideologue who um, I'll have something more to say about later on, uh, Anas al Libi, um, Abu Qatada al Fistini, and Abu Hamza al Masri, the famous hook hander, and uh, Omar Bakri Muhammad, the last of them is still a, quite a firebrand and a, a pain. Um, this is a quote by, attributed to Al-Nwar al alalaki Isn't it ironic that the two capitals of the war against Islam, Washington and Seattle, have also become among the centers of Western Jihad? So he was really saying there, as uh, preachers in terms of our radicalization efforts, uh, despite everything the Americans and uh, the Europeans have done, now uh, London and Washington are the centers of uh, radicalization for jihad. So uh, I think we can say that the internet has become what we might call a virtual uh, headquarters of jihad. Uh, it's the first web-based militant movement. Um, and of course, as such, and again, as Martin says, it's given Al-Qaeda a global reach that it's never had hitherto. Uh, nor previous militant jihadist movements that have arisen periodically over the centuries, they haven't had it either. al Suri, as I mentioned, doing an analysis of why it is only now that militant jihadism seems to be getting a, a, a firm footing is because in the past, he said, uh, we failed, or our predecessors, failed to take with us um, the Muslim Ummah. We failed to win their support. And why is that? Because they didn't have the communication means available today to Al-Qaeda. It's a very powerful tool and it supports Al-Qaeda's political and religious doctrine uh, of communicating the concept of global jihad and attracting a, a wide and continued flow of fighters for the cause. Apart from uh, the longevity of militant jihadism, it depends on uh, appealing to this expanding pool of activists as well as passive supporters too, because they feed through, or the hope is that they can be fed through. Um, I won't stop to make the point in any detail, but of course the fighters that have gone to Syria and elsewhere are using the media themselves without necessarily having a, a leader encouraging them to do this, to use uh, uh, advances in internet of uh, information and communications technology to send back messages to people at home to say you should come and join us this is the experience we have at the battlefront this is exciting this gives us a meaning to life a purpose and this is one of the quotes leave the gangster life behind and join the life of jihad that's again particularly true for those two middle groups uh, drug, former drug addicts or criminals who are looking for some purpose in life, looking to atone perhaps, putting the past behind them and moving forward. Messages like these are encouraging. Or the seeker who's, you know, really uh, got an ex existential uh, question mark. Why am I here? What am I here for? What, what should I do? Uh, uh, and they're looking for structure. Oh, oh. 
Right. I've got one minute left. <laughs> We're all suffering from this problem. <laughs> um, so uh, I just wanted to make that point. So then I'll go on. <laughs> Key aspects of the online development, as Martin again mentioned, a wider um, access to radical interpretations of Islam. Interactive sites uh, allow uh, individuals to find each other. It's like dating sites. Uh, and jihadist preachers to identify the committed. The jihadist preachers go online as a means of an after sales service in a way. They can see what's happening, they watch the communications. This person's committed or particularly vulnerable, he can be groomed, whatever. Outsourcing propaganda production in Spire magazine, again we've had mentioned that. Um, and then uh, jihadist preachers as mediators of Al-Qaeda's doctrine. Uh, we know that Muslims in the diaspora, on the whole, tend not to speak Arabic. They are dependent on these preachers to translate the uh, Quran and Hadith, to uh, translate it and interpret it for people who can't read it in the original. And of course, they can then give a spin on it, the spin that they want. Yeah. Um, again, the more websites, the better it is for us. We must make the internet our tool. Uh, that was posted on azam.com as long ago as 2002. And Awalaki oh, said this, Arabic is the international language of jihad. Most of the jihad literature is available only in Arabic and publishers, and publishers are not willing to take the risk of translating it. The only ones who are spending the money and time translating jihadi literature are the Western <laughs> Intelligence Service. And too bad they would not be willing to share it with you. And so the, the, the preachers are doing that, as I say, with their own spin. Um, just to remind, the five constants of jihad, uh, this is Olaki, jihad will continue until the day of judgment, does not depend on any individual, this is particularly important after Osama bin Laden was killed, um, not territorial in its geographic scope, so it's global, it can start anywhere, not determined the outcome of any one particular battle, but a relentless ongoing, so a setback here, never mind, move on, we'll win the battle eventually. Victory is not limited to military victory. It culminates in the total definitive supremacy of Islam. Um, got a quick sprint through there. Uh, uh, al Laki himself was an interesting character. He uh, was born in the USA, largely educated in the USA, uh, not qualified religiously, but very, as most of these preachers are, has tremendous conviction in the ability to portray it, not willing to brook any argument or any other interpretation but his own. So he provides certainty for people looking for certainty. And we really heard that in listening to the online materials. Um, he himself uh, spent years in jail in Yemen, uh, reading and studying the works of um, Sheikh Yusuf al-Uyari, uh, uh, that sheikh died in 2003 in Yemen. Um, but the, the real point is, I think, that uh, Orlaki was a major influence in radicalization. His materials are still uh, being accessed today and um, very powerful. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.